Hey, what's going on guys? Welcome back to the channel. Another beautiful day here in Southern California. Look who I'm with, Mr. Mason himself. That's right, we're hanging out, father and son. Guess where we're at today, guys? Oh, I was supposed to be telling you guys. We're at NSA, Nielsen Specialty Ammo. That's right, this is where all the magic happens. So come on, join us. Let's go and take a look and see how bullets are made. I swage anywhere from 177s up to 35 calibers. I also box all the stuff that comes off one of our other machines. I get them ready for cases and box them up, bag most of them, and sometimes help with the cleaning process. So that's mostly what I do here at NSA. Greg Nielsen. I'm a machinist here at NSA. I'm also Nick Nielsen's son. Uh, I make most of the big bore ammo here at NSA. Uh, and this is one of the swages I work on. I also have two more that I work on. Right now I'm making a 302. This is the first step of it. And then I'll be going over to that machine and making the second step. Hi, I'm Daniel. I'm Nick's oldest son. Uh, do a little bit of everything in the shop, but my main job is to run the high-speed machine. Hi, my name is Jessica Nielsen. I'm Nick's wife, and my main job is to boss him around. Yep. All right, guys, we're getting ready to go over to another part of the workshop, and Nick's going to show us how to make 45 caliber, 350, and 302 grain slugs. All right. Well, shoot. Let's go take a look. Go to the other building. All right. Right here. So it's close to our big door. We got these big fans that are usually on. We don't have them on for filming, but we want to have air circulation in here. And so the other building is temperature controlled. This building is not because of. Uh, the fumes that we get from the lead caster. Okay. So this is how we make our cores for all of our big bore lead bullets. All right, so we're going to explain how the casting process works. Um, this, this is a casting machine that uh, we've been using for about two years now. And we uh, have a very new machine. Uh, this is uh, all state-of-the-art, all new electronics. This machine was uh, designed very recently. In the last couple of years, we were actually part of that uh, process of getting this machine to market and helping with the uh, initial testing, field testing, going through, getting some of the bugs worked out of it. And this is actually a production machine right here. Uh, kind of explain uh, what all these buttons do. It's actually pretty simple. We have a temperature controller here. This is the temperature of the pot. This is our set temperature, and so when it gets a little bit out of range, it'll either uh, turn off when it gets to a certain temperature, or when it gets below a certain temperature, it'll turn back on and it'll keep a pretty tight uh, temperature range in there, which is good for consistency. This is uh, controlling how long our pour, the dwell time of the pour. So heavier bullets uh, need a much longer pour time to get enough lead down into the mold, and of course smaller bullets need a shorter uh, time. So you adjust that with this. Uh, fans here, you got uh, a fan here that you turn on, that's to cool down your, your mold, your sprues, and you got a fan on this side, and that's what this button here does. Heater, obviously, is to turn your heater on. Uh, the drive is what turns the motor on so that the molds start going around in the carousel. And the meter valve on-off switch is what controls the uh, actual pour. So you can turn the pour off, so if you want to just clear out what's in the molds, you can have them going around and around, and then keep it off so it doesn't continue to pour. And then this controls how fast we're going to have the carousel moving, how fast each bullet is made. And you have to adjust all these things, uh, the temperature, the speed, the, uh, the dwell, all those things have to be changed for each type of bullet that you're doing. Some need uh, longer cool time, so you've got to run slower. Some you can uh, 
move the carousel much faster. In fact, sometimes it'll even cast better because it, the molds stay hot, especially on small bullets where they start to cool down uh, quickly. And then what happens is the, you don't get the consistency, you don't get the fill out because the molds are cooling down because there's not enough lead getting into each bowl. And by the time that mold is, is back in turn to get poured again, it's cooled down too much. So controlling the speed is very important to get consistency out of your bullets. So that's basically how the controls work. Uh, from there, we have a 150 pound pot up here. So it holds 150 pounds of lead. Uh, you could put, you know, pure lead, you could put lead with tin, lead with antimony, a mixture of the three. Whatever you want to put in there for your lead mixture can go up in here and then through a valve it's going to pour directly into your molds uh, right through here at the top position. So at the 12 o'clock position it is pouring the lead straight into the mold. It comes down to a cooling position. The next position is actually going to turn the screw plate which is going to cut the base of the bullet or if it's a uh, nose pour it's going to cut the nose of the bullet depending which way it's oriented and so one side of a bullet when you're casting has to be flat typically that's the base so you're going to cut the sprue plate on that and then it's going to come down to the next section which is the bottom and that's where the mold is actually going to open up and it's going to spit the, the bullet out onto this side and on this side you're going to get the sprue so you get the sprues on one side and bullets on the other the sprues then can be put back into the pot remelted and continue the cycle with that. Once it's done, it's going to come up, it's going to hit a bar right here, which is going to reclose the screw plate so that it's back into position. It's going to reclose it, put it back into position. It's got one more cooling fan if you want to turn it on. And when it gets back to the 12 o'clock, it's going to pour. And there's six molds that are just going through that rotation over and over and over again. What we use this for is not to make bullets anymore. We used to. We no longer sell cast bullets. We've decided to only sell swage bullets. And so what we use this for is for making cores that go into our swaging process. So technically the first step of making a swage bullet is getting your core. So whether you get that from wire or you cast it, whatever your, your procedure is, for big bore bullets, we first make a core from a cast machine. When it goes onto our high speed machine, we use lead wire that feeds it. But for big bore, everything is made first with a cast core. Good. Oh man, that is awesome. <laughs> Look at that hollow point. Holy cow. Can we just shoot them like this? No, we got to make a second step. <laughs> All right, let's go check that out. Here we have our 457 350 grain core. We are going to throw it in our die. This core weighs about 401 grains, give or take. And we're going to throw it in our die. It's going to bleed off the excess lead. Once we make our bullet, we're going to throw it on the scale, make sure it's within our tolerance, and then as long as it meets those parameters, we will bag them and ship them to you. As you can see here, what came off the machine, this is what we call bleed, and this is what gives us our consistency when we make our, your bullets. Now that we've made our 457 350 grain bullet, now we're gonna take the 302 hollow core and throw it into the same exact setup that we made with the 350. As you can tell on this setup, there's no bleed coming off our die. However, we still have the bullet being formed.
on this machine, this is the bleed off from the slug. Yeah. Okay. Pretty cool. So what are those, 22 pounds? That is awesome. That is really neat. Alright guys, we're going to move on to the next process, which is... Cleaning. Alright, let's go see cleaning the bullets. This is like a maze. Oh, looky here. Hey, buddy. <laughs> Okay. So we're going to count all the bullets right here with our counting scale right here. But before we do that, we're going to first tumble the bullets to get rid of any burrs on there. Um, during manufacturing, you get uh, a little bit of bleed on the nose or on the base. And we want to knock as much of that off so that that doesn't get into your barrel and into your transfer port. And so the first thing we do is, is tumble these bullets. Um, the only disadvantage to that is out of there, but you can the see nice there's a, I don't know if the camera's picking it up as well uh, as we'll get in person, this a little bit but these are much duller the, than uh, these. The and so you're going you're to see a difference in some of the bullets that you received uh, from me in the past of versus the new ones. Once but that's only there, because they've been washed and cleaned. And here, these are perfectly we'll put them into clean, deeper bullets and they should be in very good shape when you get them. We're going to clean these bullets with DI water and Simple Green. Once they're cleaned, we put them onto these trays. And the trays are then put onto these racks that have fans blowing on them. And so these are being these are being dried. And but you can see the bullets are very, very clean. They got a very clean base, very clean nose. And any uh, I'll just say junk or debris that was there from the manufacturing process will be taken off in from in the uh, sonic cleaner. And then we dry them on here. Once they're dried, they get taken over into this tumbler and this tumbler is used in, well, we use a uh, slip 50 I found this to be a very good bullet lube uh, we may experiment with other lube but slip 50 seems to work really good in my personal gun and that's what we've been using in here once they get lubed uh, from here then we bring them over up to here and we'll have a big pile of bullets in here and we'll start weighing them out and this is a counting scale so once we tell the scale how many bullets uh, are in here, it'll then tell us how many pieces there are, and we can start bagging your bullets and pouring these straight into a bag. Once they're bagged, then they get boxed and put up onto the shelf, or if it's uh, for a dealer, we're going to put them in cases, and they get boxed, put into cases, and shipped off. All right, guys, here we go. We got Nick Nilsson, the man, the myth, the legend himself, Mr. NSA, Nilsson Specialty Ammo. What we're gonna do in this section, we're gonna start off with a question and answer. I have roughly eight to 10 questions. Um, I'm gonna ask the question, he's gonna give me the answer, and this is all information for you guys. So we get to find out how we got started, you know, his business, all, all the good information. So without further ado, let's go ahead and uh, get started. You ready? Ready. All right, here we go. Question number one, drum roll. <clears throat> Can you give the viewers a little background on how NSA first got started? Yep, uh, so I have another company. It's an animal control business. We trap uh, raccoons and skunks and possums, things like that. Uh, state of California requires those animals to be put down. They're not allowed to be re relocated. We use, um, we were using CO2 chambers to put the animals down. And that's basically a big chamber. You coax the animal out of the cage and into this chamber, fill it with CO2, the animal expires in there, and then we, we take them out. Problem is that be between the tanks and the cage, the uh, canister that we use on there and all the cages, it takes up a lot of room on our trucks. And so we wanted to remove some of that bulk that's sitting on our trucks. And so I wanted to use a gun, but servicing LA County, Orange County, uh, you're not allowed to uh, fire a firearm within city limits. Air guns are a lot less restricted. Technically it's not allowed, but it's a lot different uh, regulations for air guns. And so we get away with this, but since we're licensed in the state. So uh, I bought my first PCP rifle. That was a Benjamin Rogue 357. Mm -hmm. um, after that, I started buying Dragon Claws and that's what all the guys have on their trucks. 
uh, 50 caliber. Okay. And at the time, I didn't have a lot of experience with air guns. I know now I don't need that much, but at the time, you know, I was a rookie, didn't know. But that's what I ended up buying. And so um, I was using those, and I was uh, shooting firearms as a regular hobby. And so I started taking the guns to the range. Uh, pretty much would shoot firearms and then shoot a little bit of air guns, but realized the air guns are pretty fun, they're pretty accurate, and uh, started making some ammo because I wasn't happy with the ammo that I could buy. It was yeah. not good quality, it was very expensive. Uh, there wasn't a lot of choice for what was out there. Uh, so I started casting my own ammo, just you know, hand casting, which was a lot better than what I could buy out there, way cheaper. And then uh, I found a company that was making swage ammo. I, th I think it was 50 caliber, it might have been 357, I can't remember. And started looking at why is this bullet better? Like, you know, you visually can look at it and see right. that it was so much better. Um, the shape of it, the consistency of it, you weigh them, they're really, really consistent. And found out it was a swaging process. Never heard of it at the time. And this is before I was on forums. I didn't, you know, I didn't really even know there was air gun forums at the time. You know, I was really new to this whole thing. And so I, uh, I ended up buying a, um, a hand press for uh, pulling, the, pulling the bullets and realized that, uh, you know, for the small calibers, it would probably be fine. But I wasn't even shooting small calibers. I was only shooting big bore. Right. And so then I ended up buying a hydraulic press, uh, pretty expensive to, to get into. And uh, so I told my wife that I would start selling the ammunition and didn't really have the inclination to do that. I just told her that so I could buy it. Right. Uh, but <laughs> I ended up did selling some of it and then um, it just kind of started progressing from there. Other people were interested in it. And then I started buying more calibers. And then after, after a little while, I started buying some of the smaller calibers and uh, realized that even the small calibers could really benefit from having these, these small um, slugs. So eventually I started uh, buying more equipment, more dies, more punches, uh, more options, doing custom stuff for people. Then I got my kids involved and we started growing it some more and the businesses started growing and growing and growing. Uh, we reinvest, all the money we make is reinvested into the company. Uh, we basically live off my other company, that's what pays all my personal bills. Everything that we make here is reinvested in here. So, that's good. Okay. And uh, that's why we you know, buy more equipment and more dies and, and uh, really trying to move the company forward and you know the mission from day one starting this company was the ammunition is not very good that I could buy and it's way too expensive right. so the mission was if we're gonna do this we're gonna make the best ammunition we can and we're gonna do it at a price that makes it where people can afford to shoot it and we're trying to stay true to that mission okay that's awesome man that is awesome all right all right question number two guys why did you choose air gun slugs as a business and not something like air gun sales or manufacturing? Well, I didn't really choose it. You know, it just kind of happened. It was my hobby and it just kind of progressed into a business. So I didn't, you know, I'm an air gunner. That's, that's, that's really my only hobby that I have. And so it just kind of happened. I didn't really choose it. It didn't, it just kind of fell into place. Okay. All right. I like that. All right, guys. Question number three. This one I'm really interested in because I cast bullets, so I've, I've always been interested in suede slugs, so I like this question. What are some of the advantages of suede slugs over cast bullets and or pellets? Uh, well, the pellets are easy because this would be either cast or, or suede bullets. Um, you know, the BC of the bullet is much better than a, a Diabolo pellet, Diabolo having the, the waist shape. Mm -hmm. um, and the, and the hollow back, and BC is, is poor on those. They're very accurate, right. uh, but they're accurate because of the way they're stabilized. And so uh, at closer range, they're very, very good. Um, it's pretty hard to beat how, how accurate a pellet is. The problem is the long range capabilities of them is limited because the BC means that they're gonna slow down much faster than right. uh, a bullet is gonna slow down. And then uh, wind drift is probably the biggest advantage, in my opinion, for bullets. Because when you shoot at 100 yards, 150 yards, 200 yards, and you've got a crosswind, you know, a pellet moves way over to whatever yeah. side, where a bullet still moves over. It's not that it doesn't move, but it doesn't move anywhere near as much as, as a pellet. And so you may shoot a tighter group with a, with a pellet at, let's just say, 100 yards. You, you might shoot a little bit tighter group than, than, with a pellet than, than you do with a bullet. But, um, and it might be the other way around. You know, a bullet might shoot better sometimes. But when you consider the fact that you might have this much wind holdover versus this much holdover for a, for a bullet. So you have this much air built into your shot versus this much air built into your shot with a pellet. 
the bullet is going to give you more hits to target than a pellet is in, in the right. wind. When there's no wind and it's perfect and you could you could shoot the best group that you ever shot in your life, take a picture and go put it up on Air Gun Nation and Facebook and the GTA, that, that's great. But when you get out in the field and you got one shot, you know, because when you shoot at a target and it hits here, you can just make a compensation. Oh, I got to hold two mil dots over and I'll be on bullseye. But when you're hunting, that's not, the animals don't just sit there and wait for you to, to, to make a correction and take another, your next shot, the animal takes off. Right. So it's because you have one shot, one kill, if that, that should be the way you're hunting, then bullet is gonna give you many more shots on the first shot that you're gonna make your kill because you have that much error built into your shot versus this much error when you're shooting in the wind. To me, that's the biggest advantage. For the uh, cast bullet versus the swage bullet, consistency really is the advantage of swage. Um, out of the barrel, one, one disadvantage of the swage bullets is they shoot a little bit slower out of the barrel because there's more barrel contact. There's no loop grooves built into the bullet design. So that's more contact with the barrel. However, once they leave the barrel, they also have a very good BC because they're perfectly smooth. There's, no, there's nothing on, on the wind that's, that's hitting that that's going to be interfering with the, uh, the flight of the bullet because it's perfectly smooth all the way down the bullet. So in my opinion, that's an advantage. People can argue it and I'm sure we can have People on both sides of that, you know, right. arguing the different thing. But to me, that's an advantage. The other advantage is that when you shoot a bullet, you want very sharp edges on the back of your bullet um, on that base. Well, when you cast bullets, you don't always get nice sharp edges right. because you've got a sprue that's being cut, and the lead sometimes is not perfectly formed there. But on a swage bullet, because it's pressed with cold lead, which every bullet is the same, every bullet is, is perfectly flat on the, on the back, and you don't have any of those round edges, everything's very sharp, and every bullet is the same bullet after bullet after bullet. Okay, and I can definitely testify to that being a long-term or long-time cast bullet uh, person. I do it as a hobby, as most of you guys know. When he got into swaging, we were having discussions as to which was more consistent and which was better. And when he started making the ammo, I was measuring your ammo, and I was getting like a tenth of a grain variance with my cast bullets it was like two grains with pellets I see two grains difference between one to the next pellet so as far as consistency I can testify there I, I haven't seen anything more consistent and, than that and another advantage is no sorting right you, yeah you don't have to which sort I anything. do a lot of right I do a lot of sorting I you take those two grains and you might cast 200 bullets and out of the 200 you have 150 half a grain increment a hundred another half a grain increment 100 here, but your other 50 are whole another grain apart from those two, so you throw those back in the pot. With swaging, no reason to do yeah. that. They're all the same. Yeah. Good stuff. All right, guys, moving on to the next question. Oh, this is a good one, because I want to know this. How many slugs are produced in a day at NSA? None of your business. All right, next question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys, here we go. Next question. In your opinion, what is the future of agon projectiles? Uh, well, I think slugs are going to start to get more popular. Um, I don't think they're taking over pellets. I don't think they're going to be, you know, what everybody shoots. I think they're just going to be a part of the air gun community. Okay. They have their advantages. They have their disadvantages. You know, if you're shooting up in the air, I don't really like shooting slugs up at, uh, I don't shoot birds very often, but if I do, uh, slugs is not usually my choice, to be honest with you, because I don't like how far they're going to travel. Right. Um, I shoot in a lot of, you know, kind of urban areas that I don't want a, a, a bullet that's going to be going out there and shooting further than I really want because of the backdrops back there and I don't know where that bullet's going. Right. So there is an advantage to pellets uh, slowing down. Also if I'm shooting like in a, um, like maybe a barn or something where I'm shooting up into uh, the roof area, I'm going to shoot a low power gun and I'm going to shoot a pellet that's going to slow down quicker. So I'm going to use low power, a projectile that has a poor BC because it's not about power at that point. It's just about making contact very close range. It's like if I was in this building or something. Right. And uh, I don't want to go through the roof. I don't want damaging the building. And so pellets have their advantages. Right. However, if I'm out shooting ground squirrels, prairie dogs, coyotes, I want a bullet because uh, I want some mushrooming of the bullet. I want uh, a better BC for, for shooting in the wind, uh, for, for bullet drop and retained energy. Right. So there's advantages to both. So I just don't think that one projectile really covers it all. And I think that there's so many scenarios that we shoot in that having bullets, having pellets, who knows, maybe there'll be something else that comes out down, down in the future. That having different projectiles and, and different types of air guns and different calibers, all the different things that we have to shoot, I think is a big advantage. And I think slugs is just a part of that. Right. I 100% agree with that. Um, 
I see that question a lot on YouTube as far as slugs are now out, you know, um, they're more popular now than they have been and five, ten years and cheaper five, ten years ago. And people try to make the argument that pellets are somehow going to disappear. And it's no. like, no, they're not. There is a definite place for pellets. And I don't ever see the slug market. I think it's just going to become more of a now you have two choices. Yeah. And depending on what your use is. Yeah. And, and that's exactly it. Like if I like you say, if I own a farm and I have coyotes that are 150, 200 yards mm -hmm. away, I'm going to go to the slug and I might even own a, a gun specifically right. for slugs. And then I'm still going to have my, you know, whatever air gun, my, my Benjamin Marauder or FX or whatever gun you have to specifically shoot 50, 75 yard targets. Mm -hmm. And that's when I'll shoot pellets. So it'll, I, in my opinion, like you, it'll never be pellets are gone, slugs are in. Right. It's just going to be, Oh look, I have two choices. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, guys. Next question. Can you tell the viewers how much R and D goes into finding that perfect slug for different air guns? Because I mean, there are a lot of air guns out there, and they all have different barrels. It seems. Yeah, it's, the, the tough part on air guns is we don't have, like when you know, like in powder burners, you know, you have a 457 air gun. They're all 44, 45 caliber gun they're all going to be you know 457 or 450 whatever whatever the caliber is and they're going to have similar twist rates for um, that caliber if you shoot a 308 i mean there are different twist rates with them but they're all going to be 308 right in air guns we have twist rates that are all over the map we have sizes that are all over the map right. we have choked and not choked yeah. <laughs> and and then the manufacturers don't let us know what size the barrels are what size the choke is it's, it's a free-for-all right that makes it difficult to make bullets for. So just as a, some extreme examples of twist rates, you have, um, and this is not saying one, one is better than the other, just, just the extremes. You'll have something like, um, let's say a, a Benjamin Bulldog, that's got a one in 14 twist in a 357. You have American Air Arms Slayer with a one in 26 in their, in their gun. That's a big that's difference, a huge, huge difference. Um, you got some some guns wanting 355, 356, 357, 358, 359, or 360 as far as the size diameter that shoots best in their gun. Well, that's very difficult to make ammunition for all these different guns when there's all these twist rates. They have uh, very different uh, barrel diameters. And we're talking about the internal, not the outside diameter, but the internal diameter of the, right. of the barrel. Uh, makes it very difficult. If you want to put things on a high-speed press, uh, you want to make your ammunition all exactly the same so that you can run that machine for a long time so that, that that's how you bring the price down. Because one of the complaints people have is, gosh, air gun ammunition is so expensive. Well, I understand why. You can't do these really long runs of any one bullet because there's so many options. That's why my catalog is so big. So you can't run your machines all day for two days with one bullet and then stock up on that because that's how you make ammunition really cheap. That's why firearms you know, they run their machines all day, every day yeah, on the same bullet over. I've been to the manufacturing company and their bullet, they, they have lines of machines all running the same thing over and over and over and they run 24 seven. That's why the ammunition is cheaper. So they, they don't, they don't spend time resetting up the machines because that takes time. They're not doing R and D for the next one. And um, that's why you're ammunition is priced the way it is, is because there are so many options and you don't have these long runs of the same ammunition over and over and over again. So what we do is, even if it's going on the high-speed machine, we're going to develop it off of our small presses, hand presses. We're going to make different bullets. We're going to make them different diameters, different sizes, different bases. It might be a, a bow tail, it might be a, a dish base, a flat, a flat base, a cut base, uh, some custom thing that we do, a hollow base, whatever it is. And then we're going to change the nose profile. We're going to make them hollow point, deeper hollow point, wider hollow point, all these different options, which we do with different pins and different punches. And we're going to see what shoots best. Problem is, it doesn't shoot. You know, one gun shoots this diameter and this style. This gun shoots this this one and this style. Um, and so it's hard to come up with one bullet that's going to work in all these guns. But I can't have 40 different designs so that it works in every single gun. So you have to try and come up with bullets that are going to work in the widest variety of guns that you can. And that's where the challenge comes in. And then where the expense comes in is not only coming up with all the different tooling. But then we got to make the ammunition, and then we got to send it to someone like yourself, who can go out and test. And you have certain guns, and then you know I'll send them to the next person. He's got a different set of guns, and the next person. And so we're getting that, and, we're, and then we're getting the feedback. 
and then okay so this seems to work in this gun but it didn't really work in any of these guns so let's make some changes um, we're going to change the base punch or the nose profile we're going to change uh, the diameter wow. and then we're going to resend it out again and then we're going to get more data collected wow. and so it takes a long time so you know you get the, the tooling in and say you get it in january and you all right you start sending it out it, it might it might take you three or four months to finally get something that that works in a wide variety of guns and that you know there's no magic pill that works in everything right so it, it does and then other times as we're getting more experience we kind of have figured out kind of a formula that works so we've narrowed down that three or four months down to a much tighter uh, space now but it still takes time it still takes money and once we get it then we kind of kind of roll with it but it, there's a lot that goes into it yeah. it's not just buy it and, and make it and then it just magically works right. there's so much tooling uh, that I have that di didn't work right. you know and so much lead that we've put down range that didn't work you know you're only seeing the final product that actually ended yeah. up working yeah. but there's a lot of bullets that went through we melted all down and uh, you know whatever doesn't work but there's a lot to it a lot of time a lot of money a lot of frustration there's, there's days where just there's not a single bullet we took out that worked and it's really frustrating yeah. and then you go out the next time and you know you, you start figuring out those days are kind of behind us because we've got formulas we actually have spreadsheets that take in a lot of different information and we can kind of we draw all of our bullets in CAD I kind of showed that to you mm -hmm. I, I right. do it. and uh, we will um, take the calculations in the CAD program, make adjustments, and we can get it pretty close on the first or second try now because uh, we really have a formula that seems to work. So right there, you are actually using CAD programs to draw designs. Yeah. Yep. Wow. So yeah, wow. Same, same program that I make parts that go into like our CNC machine or anything, you know, the same type of program or that same exact program. Uh, it tells you certain parameters that, that you have in there, even the weight. I know what weight uh, the bullet's going to be when I order my tooling. Uh, I already know what the weights are going to be and, and where, where it's going to fall within a, within a grain or two of wow. where it's going to be. Okay. Mm -hmm. Wow. And I can actually relate to a lot of that because on a smaller scale though, because take for instance, I cast bullets. <clears throat> you have an air gun with uh, somebody's barrel, whoever, TJ, it could be anybody's barrel. And you buy a mold based on the shape. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And as humans, we look and we say, well, that bullet looks good. Mm -hmm. Well, look, what does look good mean yep. to a barrel? It doesn't. So what ends up happening, making it short, is you end up with, say, 308. You buy seven moles at almost $100 each after shipping. Only one works. Yep. So you got six moles sitting on that shelf that don't work. So I understand exactly what you're saying. You buy tooling at X expense for the tooling. You make a bullet. It doesn't work at all. Well, now that tooling... And multiply it by 10 for swaging. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> However, in swaging, though, you can make adjustments. You can change punches. You can, so to change the base, change the, uh, you can't change the nose profile, but you can change the, without changing the die, but you can change the, like, the hull point, how big it is, how deep it is. And you can also change the weight by making the body of the bullet longer or shorter. Okay. okay. All right. That's a good point. Yeah. All right, guys. Next question. We're getting to the end here. All right, Nick, I noticed you have a CNC machine in your shop over here. Um, and you've already started making special tools like the uh, pressure gauge removal tool. Mm -hmm. um, you have any more items in the future you plan on making you care to discuss? So the machine really is made or purchased so we can make our own tooling for our, our machines, keep them up and going because it takes a long time to get uh, specialty tools made. Uh, it could be six, eight, ten weeks and sometimes we need them faster than that. Plus we want to do our own R&D. Very expensive to have the tooling made and then you know we we're kind of discussing earlier where some of the stuff doesn't work well you buy all this tooling it doesn't work and you got you know you got to retest and retest and retest not only you got to wait six eight ten weeks to get it but then it doesn't work and so we need right. to cut down that time and the expense of r&d so we bought a machine for that that was part of the reasons part of the justification um also it's to make some uh, specialty parts that we that we want that are hard to get made by somebody um we made uh, you know like that air force gauge tool um that's something that we kind of came up with afterwards. It wasn't a, a pre-thought, but things like that, we probably will make some other tools. Like we have some other ideas that we, we want to do. It's really a matter of time. Uh, you know, getting production done is my, my major focus. Um, one thing that we would like to do, we have been toying with it and, and, and experimenting with it, is trying to do drop-in barrels that will shoot slugs. Um, we have some custom tooling made to uh, to make them. They shoot fantastic. These barrels we bought, but they're they're letting up too fast, so we're not happy with that. And um, you know, if you know anything about NSA and, and our quality standards, we're not going to sell stuff that we're not happy with. So right. 
Um, although the guns shoot fantastic, we have to hand lap every barrel to get them to do it. And there's just no way that we, that's feasible for production. So uh, we're still looking for a barrel company that meets our standards. We haven't met it yet. Um, but if we can find a barrel manufacturer that can do the quality, the, uh, they can do the quantity that we need because we're going to buy them in bulk and, and make them drop in ready, uh, make it at a price that makes sense to do production with them, then we do plan to make things that will work with our bullets that will be drop in ready that you can take your barrel out, slide your barrel in. Um, once we program the CNC machine, you know, it's fairly quick to, to be able to do that. Uh, so that's kind of the future that we have. Uh, okay. No guarantee it's going to happen because if we can't find something that makes sense for production right. and, and meets our quality standards, we're not going to do it. Okay. But if we can get those parameters done, that's the future. Wow. I'm excited about this one. So are you going to do drop-in barrels for varying guns or just one type? Or are you going to start with, like, say, maybe Air Force or something? Or? Well, you know, Air Force, anybody who knows me knows Air Force. I have a lot of Air Force guns. Um, they're one of my favorite manufacturers. I love them. They're, they're, there's just so much you can do with them. they got a lot of power. You like them, too. Yeah, you know? I do. And uh, so definitely Air Force would 100% be, be on there. And, and a lot of other guns. You know, Ed Gun's another one of my favorite uh, gun manufacturers out there. Um, I'd like to do barrels for them because okay. I think they're one of the highest quality guns out there. Yeah, man. Oh, guys, this is getting good. All right. All right, guys, here's our last question. We're going to combine a couple of questions, but uh, they're one and the same. So here we go. Can you tell the viewers where your ammo can be found for purchase? And is there a link where customers can get the latest NSA updates? So. Dealers are being added all the time, so the easiest place to go would be to our dealer link, which is right on our website. Okay. So NielsenSpecialtyAmmo.com, there's a menu on the side, it says dealers, click dealers, it'll give you a whole list of retailers that sell our ammunition. Okay. Um, that's for international or for domestic uh, dealers. And then for latest information, uh, Facebook is a really good place. We have a Facebook page, Nielsen Ammo, on Facebook. We also uh, put posts on to Airgun Nation and to the GTA. Uh, two great websites to get a lot of good information. So between those three places, if you visit any of them, you know, you can get a lot. But Facebook's probably the best because we post on there a lot, and a lot of people will ask questions on there, mm -hmm. which we'll respond to, and that's a good place because sometimes they ask the same questions you're curious about too. So okay. it's a good kind of a Q&A there right there okay. on Facebook. Oh, for that's, good. Things. that's good. Okay, and I'll put those links down in the description at the bottom, guys. That wraps it up for this segment of Questions and Answers with NSA Ammo. Mr. Nick, I appreciate it, man. Yep. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we'll see you guys on the next one. All right, guys, we're done with the tour. I got to give a big shout out and a big thanks to the whole Nielsen family. You guys were awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. I hope you guys enjoyed it. We are out of here. <laughs> we can do this. In <laughs> <coughs> That'll go in the blooper reel. Are right, you ready? Yep. All right, guys. I'm here. <laughs> blooper. <laughs> Three seconds in, we got our first blooper. All right, guys. Now that we've seen Nick and his wife and his kids, and uh, blah, 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 blah. let's go back with that. Take two. Take two. Question one. Action. <laughs> it makes me laugh, I can't help it. <laughs> I think he's going to show us how to make the 457... 302 bullet. 302 bullet. <laughs> <laughs> now that we're done with the first step of the 302 hollow core, we're going to make the second step. But first, I'm going to show you how to make the 350 grain with our 350. Anything you want to say about Nick? This is for me only. Okay, come on. Could you give me something? Huh? He's a cool guy. He's cool? Yeah. I like him. You guys smell bullshit? <laughs> yep, I do. <laughs>